on May 10th, 1869, history was made. Through sheer determination and pure ingenuity, the Union Pacific Railroad and the Central Pacific Railroad met up at Promontory Summit, linking a nation with a single ribbon of steel. Nearly 150 years later, that same determination and pure ingenuity would lead to more history-making events, as the Union Pacific Railroad once again brought back the Union Pacific Big Boy, and on May 2nd, 2019, operated her under her own steam for the first time since 1959. On May 4th, 2019, she and her sister, number 844, the living legend, departed Cheyenne for Ogden, Utah. Today on Trackside, we are going to operate number 4014 as she makes her way to Ogden, Utah via Sherman Hill. So strap in and grab yourself a cup of coffee because this one's going to be a long one. This is The Return of the Giants, Part 1. Hey, what's up guys, Shadow Steel here, and welcome to the end of the Sherman Hill Saga. So, this was not the original plan for the Sherman Hill Saga, mind you. I was actually going to do a series of scenarios I was making for the 1950s version of Sherman Hill, uh, called The End of an Era. It's gonna be, it was, it, it was going to be a series of scenarios for that route, but as of right now, they're still in the work, so maybe we'll see them in the near future. But, instead, I decided to make a quick little scenario, and it's still in the works as of this recording, but by the time the video is released on May 10th, 2019, it will be out and ready to play. It is The Return of the Giants Part 1, and this is a five-part series, uh, with, the, with one of the parts being a prologue, a sort of break-in run for the 4014, uh, yes, that's right, we're basically running the 4014 this time around. So, while this logo screen loads up, essentially, I will go ahead and tell you f the stats and facts about this little scenario set, or at least this particular scenario in general, and, well, what you can expect. It's the morning of May 4th, 2019, and you have been given the chance of a lifetime. You will be operating Union Pacific Big Boy number 4014 over Laramie, as part of the 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad's completion. There are over 800,000 people lining the tracks, so make sure you give them a good show. The DLC packs you'll need are as followed. The Union Pacific Big Boy, Union Pacific Challenger, and Union Pacific FEF3 are the three main DLCs you'll need for the consist. You'll also need the Union Pacific SD70 pack, the Union Pacific GP30 pack, the Union Pacific SD60M, the Union Pacific Turbine, the Union Pacific Centennial Diesel, and possibly the SD70 Volume 2 pack. However, that is up for debate. The entire scenario is about 70 to 75 minutes long and travels about a little over 20 to 30 miles. Traffic is, of course, very light, considering you're traveling down track 3 for most of the run. There are a few trains sitting on the sidings as you pass by, as well as quite a few crowds gathered around the tracks. 
There's been a lot of attention to detail made to the scenario. A lot of people and a lot of cars line the tracks. So it's proper that you use the whistle as much as possible. There is a whistle mod being made properly for the big boy. And the bell that you hear in the video is from the Union Pacific 844, which is from Railworks America. The link to that mod can be found in the description below. That's what I was looking for. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to turn my audio down here on my headset. Oh, God damn it. Doing it again. All right. Good morning, Engineer. Today is the day we take Union Pacific 4014 and 844 to Ogden, Utah. Our scheduled departure time is 10 a.m. So I'm going to pause here. Actually, there we go. So I'll... Uh, so, obviously, already, right off the bat, we've got a lot going on here in Cheyenne. I do want to show this off before we really get into the meat and bones of the scenario. First off, um, hold on while I cough. That was ironic. Ah. First off, you can obviously tell we got a crowd here in Cheyenne. So, all the way here... And don't worry about that sound. I'm actually going to mute that, by the way. Because there's a bit of a hiss sound as it, in the background. If my wallpaper engine is glitching out every so often. So I don't know what I'm doing here. So we have... So from here, at the base of the Cheyenne Depot, to all the way back over here, towards the first major switch, the major junction, the signal here, you got a crowd of people. Over two thousand people were in Cheyenne the day uh, the big boy operated left Cheyenne and it kind of showed and I made it show a little bit and there's actually quite a few people further down the line just not many I, I still need to play some more people uh, you got the parking lot here filled one guy uh, Sage I will actually give him credit he said that the parking lot here looks like the amount of people that went to see Endgame which I haven't seen but I don't really care too much about that kind of stuff. So you got this parking lot over here that's filled up. Um, so all the parking lots on this side are filled. You got this set over here that's filled too. But I didn't realize that that was employees. Then you've got some idling locomotives here in the yard. Some ES-44 ACs. Got a F-7 unit. Which, by the way, the F-7 unit... Technically, when I placed her down, I knew that the Union Pacific did have a set of F7s in the roundhouse somewhere as like a sort of display item. I didn't know what number it was, so I just randomly put down the number 1474. Over here, we've got 4014's actual tender sitting out in the yard, got the number on it and everything. And the, a set of SD40s just sitting here in the yard. With a peculiar look of number here. The number 9 is not correct on there. So, GG, Dovetail. GG. A set of cars in the yard here. The yard's going to be a lot more filled out once I get things done. But as of right now, I just put on a, a bit of a show contest here. Got some freight locomotives here getting ready to depart. ES-44, SD-70, SD-70M, and SD-70M. 
as well. So we got a couple of them. Going back over here, you got some freight cars sitting out in the yard here. Or, no, passenger cars sitting out in the yard. And over here, way down here, actually, you have more freight cars, actually. I forgot about these guys. You have some hoppers sitting out in the yard here. And then you have the SD40 somewhere here. Where is he? There's an SD40 that's... Oh, there he is. There's an SD40 here that's, using yard, that's going through yard movement here. So, you'll see him moving in a bit. But yeah, the Cheyenne yard is going to be quite busy during this scenario. So, we will unpause now. Let's set up the light now. Turn on the light. Our speed has been limited to 35 miles per hour for this run but shouldn't but th that shouldn't be a problem for our nine car cons nine car train behind us plus the big boy has been gear is geared to run 70 miles an hour so this should be a walk in the park for us we do have nine passenger cars directly behind us and a flag unit locomotive number 8937 directly behind us now i've been hearing things that the locomotive the uh, SD70 behind them was a nose light, like had a nose light on it rather than the top light. But since this is going on the workshop, we do not have that option. Our main concern will be the people lining the tracks to see us. We don't want another incident like we did back on, <laughs> during the 2018 Cheyenne Frontiers days. And I will talk about that one another a little later. Oops. There we go. Got the gear set up. This is one of the reasons why our speed has been limited to 35 miles per hour. We want to make sure that every everyone is safe during during this run, especially those trackside. And ironically enough, that actually came in handy for the big boy. Uh, there was an incident not far from. Evanston, I believe it was, where there was apparently they were doing work on the tracks and rocks got on the line to the point where the big boy couldn't pass. Normal freight consists could pass, but the big boy was a bit too big. So the other reason that being that the other reason being that 4014, this will be the fir first. This will be 4014's first long distance run under her own power since 1959 keep that in mind guys this has been nine it's been over 60 years since this locomotive has been operated under her own steam as a result we don't know how she'll respond during her first excursion but yeah she's been out of service for a long time she's been a museum piece since 1959 Wait for it. Alright. We'll be traveling down track three all the way to. Uh, we'll be traveling down all the way. We'll be traveling down track three on the Laramie subdivision. It's only during our return trip that we will travel down Sherman Hill. And that's Sherman Hill proper, not actual Sherman, not the roots. Because they actually travel down track three the entire way to Laramie. It does not go over Sherman Hill. Which is interesting, to say the least. Where is the that looks too bad. Alright. That's it for that's all for the briefing. We should get ready to depart. All right. Now the time to sound the bell. That is 844's actual bell that I've modded onto the big boy just for this run, really. All aboard! Next stop, Laramie. So 
if you haven't heard, that's the whistle of the big boy that I've used on this locomotive. That's the actual whistle he carries now. So, that's like moving her. Slowly but surely, she moves under her own steam again. Nah, fuck it. Easy to start moving fast. Gotta go fast! Oh, I wonder if I that's being used as stereo audio, not mono. Because the mono, because I've learned recently that um, the the game can't handle stereo audio. So if you try to make a sound mod for the game and use stereo audio, it ends up screwing with it so badly. And I wonder if that's the case, and that's why the whistle is acting like that. I still need to tinker with it, but I plan to release that whistle alongside the scenario for people to use. The bell, however, that is available on Railworks America already. You can go ahead and pl play around with it yourself. It was a very simple add-on to the big boy, really. I could really add it on to any locomotive. Because he just provided the sound file, he didn't really provide any scripts for a specific locomotive. So, I could easily replace the Union Pacific 844's bell with her own bell. But I figured... Smokebox has already did a great job with this old girl, so I didn't want to mess with it, really. Unless that was him that actually uploaded the file, but I don't think so. He's He's been known to upload files for Elmer's America himself, too. Like beta files of new updates that were coming out. Lower the throttle here, get a slow down here as we approach. Like I said, we got quite the crowds coming around us. Oh, let's see here. I'm gonna I'm hitting that one percent, oh, eight point eight percent soon. More cars in the yard here, and then over here, uh, I'm gonna sneeze now. God damn it! It's not far out there, but right down here, we got another bit of uh, bit of a crowd showing up. We got a crossing activation. Okay, there we go. All right, let's come along the line now. I'll hear the whistle. I need to change that quite a bit. Rolling by. Oh, I'm speeding now. God damn it. Am I still going zero for that? No, I shouldn't be. More cars sitting in the yard here. Now, because of uh, the, the uh, old double heading bug, I need to keep an eye on the water via the F5 HUD, um, various issues there. Nonetheless, I got quite a bit of action going on here. Paces already. I got my allergies. We got another train coming down here. You can obviously saw, see it in the distance. Uh, all EMD power on this one. Go ahead and get in position here to get a good shot of this one. Oh god. 
So you got an SD70M on the front end, SD70M-2 uh, towards the rear of that consist, and the Centennial right in the middle. A little sandwich there. Train is 125 cars long here, which is typical for American trains. You know, all the way down to the end, we got two SC40 trains in there. Ah, I feel I sound sick, but I'm not. I'm not sick because I got allergies. What are you doing? Oh, I'm just goofing off there. All right, you're good. Well, I'm starting to increase the throttle to get 35. I should love to pick up an auto if I have to do it before this recording. Oh well. So if you haven't noticed, uh, the track speed is 35 miles per hour. However, if you've been paying attention to some of the, if you ever paid attention to the speed limits on Sherman Hill, you'll see that the actual speed is meant to be 50 miles an hour. I had to physically go into the editor, thankfully the scenario editor, not the actual route editor, and edit the the edit the route the lines configuration, at least the one that the big boy is traveling on, to specifically tell the big boy to run at 35 miles an hour. Now this is for both freight and passenger speeds, because apparently Sherman Hill doesn't have the varying passenger speed and freight speed on this particular segment of the line. It's all one speed. So you got that going for you. Now if I remember right, there's also another crossing up here that features some more people waiting for us. Uh, yes, we're not actually far from it. We got another freight train coming by. This time a double stack. Now this one, I like some of these every so often. If you like, you're gonna be seeing these little spots here and there where cars just show up and people are lining the tracks. Uh, this is for good reason because. There was a lot of people that, if you watch any video of the chase of the big boy, you're going to see a lot of people. There's going to be a lot of them. A lot. And I've kind of sort of mimicked that as best I could with this scenario. So, the people, all the people, most, almost 90% of the time, if you see a large crowd of people, it's always going to be the 2D sprite. It's never going to be 3D. And that's to save up on RAM. Now, Cheyenne does see a bit of a lag drop, a, a frame rate drop in that area because of all the people, but it's not as severe as what it would have been if I had 3D per people on there. Um, so, you got that. Uh, Passing by and click. I'm trying to get a good screenshot of the train rolling by. I have the brakes still on relief. I didn't actually have them on hold. They're running anyway. And like I said, that that this scenario is going on the workshop. That's why you're seeing a lot of just standard cars from Railworks and everything like that. You're not seeing a lot of repaints. There is a repaint for the big boy that features the chalk markings called where she was written on saying big boy which is a homage to how she got her name now this is an interesting fact she actually was not going to be called the big boy class she was going to be called the wasatch class which not surprisingly is where the sherman hill area is it's on the wasatch mountain range and through and so the story goes that while Al, one of the while Alco was building some of the first batches of the Union Pacific Big Boys, a guy who saw the smoke box alone, this part here, he wrote on the smoke box, "Big Boy" in chalk, and the name stuck. 
I mean, everybody kind of agreed. Yeah, that sounds about right. And the name sucks. She's the only type of her kind of her class that really kind of has that unique name. And actually, the Union Pacific was probably one of the only railroads to operate the Big Boy. Now, they're not the only railroads to operate the Challenger, which is her sister class. Like, the 3985 is one of the few survivors. In fact, there's only two survivors of the Challenger class, and I believe seven survivors of the Big Boys. And as for the FEF-3s, two proper FEF-3s have survived, and I think another one of the FEF-1 class has survived as well. I think there's a crossing up ahead. But yeah, this is actually one of those, um, with the Union Pacific Steam era, it has somewhat survived in great detail thanks to the Union Pacific Steam program. But once you really look into it, some of the more famous classes were only made famous after their essential, like, their first introduction to the rail scene. Because, here's another crowd here, and this time we got 3D people. They do not look happy. Okay, here we go. But yeah, the Big Boy, the Challenger, they only were made famous after, really. Well, technically, the Big Boys were famous well dur during the Steam era. But the Challengers, I feel that 3985 really perpetuated the, the Challenger class as a whole. She was made much more famous, the class was made much more famous thanks to the efforts of the Steam crew and restoring the Big Boy, the Challenger. And the same now goes for the Big Boy. I need to fix that whistle too. I don't know why this grass is like this. It's weird. Oh, floating grass. We're up to uh, our next stop, our next position here. A oh, yellow block. Yeah, I'll go water level, 64%, we're good. We're coming up on Spear, now Spear is another large area that I put a lot of rail fans on. So I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and go ahead and see if I can get over there, but I'm not sure if I'm close enough to the raft line yet. Oh, I might be. I'm going to have to press tab to get the clearance into the area. So, there's a few Easter eggs sitting around here that people might not be aware of. First, the first of which is this right here. For many people that watched the 4014 come, come back to Cheyenne for the first time in 2014, they might recognize how this consist is laid out. This is the contest that was directly behind 4014, including the two boxcars and the crew's, the, basically the crew car that essentially, uh, the crew, auto, in fact, kind of stuff, this stuff here. I made this here just to kind of give a bit of emphasis on the area. For the line over here, in Spear, at the crossing, you got quite the crowd already gathering. And this is actually because that area is rather famous. This area is rather famous, so. Get far enough, you can't see the render distance. But, yeah, I got a few, uh, quite a few cars here. Some 3D personnel. Some 3D characters here. Mostly 2D. Okay, so, we're coming up to the side here. Ah, fuck. Try and keep us at good uh, good speed here. There we go. Oh, 
We'll need to stop just ahead of the, just ahead, we need to, we'll need to stop just ahead to let the RVKC manifest clear the block. If you don't know what that consist is, you'll see in a moment. We've got clearance all the way through. What's that going on over there? Alrighty. Not doing too bad timing wise. We're actually going right on schedule. So I'm going to go ahead and go a little further down the line here. This little area here. I'm, so these cars are actually built into the route, but I just put the people here just to, you know, kind of give some emphasis on the area. Arriving in the area soon. God darn it, I got that song stuck in my head. I've been watching the Sonic trailer, Sonic movie trailer quite a bit. Because I'm actually excited for that mo the freaking movie. There we go. We're going through the single mail. Let's look at the water, 77%. We're not doing too bad in terms of just filling up the boiler. We need to keep it on this next signal. What the fuck? I've been having scenery pop ins like that lately a lot. A lot lately. But yeah, like I mentioned before, I have, I've been watching the Sonic the Hedgehog movie trailer for a bit. My god, I don't understand, I, I guess I can understand why people are upset by the trailer. But at the same time, I'm one of those people that actually was laughing at the trailer a little bit. Because it was one of those like, uh, yeah, that sounds about right, that's, the, that's pretty much what Sonic is. Because it's a very aware kind of, I, I feel like they're aware of what the franchise essentially has become. And... That in and of itself was funny to see. I, I mean, I love the fact that Sonic's design is honestly a little bit wonky. Dr. Ivo Robotnik, or Dr. Eggman, depending on who you want to ask, really. Uh, his, the, Jim Carrey's depiction of Dr. Ivo Robotnik slash Dr. Eggman. Uh, it's one of those things that you look at it, you look at it some more, you hear him say the lines, you hear him talk about the character, you hear him talk as the character, and then you suddenly realize he's just doing Ace Ventura. I've seen clips of his Ace Ventura stuff, and this sounds pretty much on par with what the series, the character was. Oh, there's the manifest just ahead of us. He's already passed, he's already gotten past the crossover here, so... We're a bit late, but it's okay. We'll have some time to go through. So, RVKC, if you guys don't remember, is the military train. Yep, the military train that we drove on the UP Military Special was labeled RVKC. And as a result, I decided to plop the same train in the raft the scenario here. That way you guys could, you know, see what happened after you dropped off your cargo or dropped off your like stop at where you ended up so let's pull to the stop here wait for it all right we're stopped here. The contest is still going. We won't have enough, so I'll probably put a text box in like, if the train is clear, go ahead and pass. Let's go ahead and move ahead. 
quite a got a small crowd going on over here. And a work team over here, the track team. I feel like I'm gonna put track crews every so often. That way it seems like people are pretty busy on this line. Almost done? Yeah, there's the tail end. Bradley's. And then the signal there. Alright, so back to the Sonic trailer, actually, now that I think about it. Um, like I said, I, under, I kind of understand why people are upset by this trailer, why people are kind of like, this is not Sonic, but I kind of like it. In all seriousness, I was laughing at some of the jokes, and um, they are some, some of the jokes I actually find pretty much so, Sonic, Sonic style. So, yeah, you got that going for you. Alright, so now we're departing. I actually have enough water in the boiler. We don't need to prime the cylinder there. Alright, time to the whistle again. I'm probably going to boost the audio of this whistle every time it, well, every time you start, every, every time I blow it. But then again, I have videos of the actual whistle in question. I need to fix it too, honestly. Because that whistle is not in good. Like, it's obviously kind of looping badly. And off we go! I forgot about the passenger view on the train, honestly. Let's set up here. Okay, there we go. Crossing over the crossing here. I'm gonna kind of pop up for you. Actually, no, I'm gonna go over here and wave the crowd. This was always a common occurrence with a lot of rail, rail, rail excursions early in the 1990s and 2000s, where people would scream at you as they rolled by. There's one particular clip that I always laugh at, kind of. It was said it's during the Frisco 1522's last excursion. I'm gonna pretty much show the clip here. But um, it was one of those like little moments where you could tell there were people that they knew this was the end of an era for St. Louis, and they just like was hooting and hollering and you know, that kind of thing. Oh, God damn it! We're fucking sweating here. Yeah, it was. Yeah, the the Saint, the excursions nowadays. You can't do this. You can't ride on the um, passenger. Like, on the passenger thing, like, 
The vestibules, that's what they're called. These things are called the vestibules. You can't ride these anymore. So you can't lean your head out the window and grab video like this. Um, this is mainly because of not only the FRA, the FRA kind of cracking down on this, but because of several major derailments that have occurred on steam excursions where literally this... I think this was made, I think the two big ex the derailments happened with uh, Norfolk Southern actually in 1990. Well, 1980 and 1990. The first major derailment happened with 611. Uh, for those of you that don't know, 611 was involved in, a, god damn it. There we go. Ah, nope. Okay. So for those of you that don't know, 611 was involved in a major derailment in the 1980s during her during one of her earliest excursions. Referred to as the Great Dismal Swamp Derailment, so one of the passenger cars picked a switch, um, derailing that car, shoving a bunch of the other cars into each other, some of them toppling over on their sides. Uh, it was pretty bad. Like videos of the actual event, uh, of the aftermath of the the actual like crash and everything my god I'm surprised nobody was killed the train was going about what I, from what I can gather it looked like the train was going about 45 to 50 miles an hour so roughly the same speed as we're going um, she had all the passenger equipment mind you for this excursion were older generation cars from the Southern Railways program many of which were in disrepair to some extent. Um, the switch in the area was in bad shape. I mean, keep in mind, Norfolk Southern had just been formed. They had just been incorporated in 1982, I believe. Uh, and uh, she was just... And much of the equipment had been running as part of the Southern Steam Program since 1960. So keep that. So it's been. So many of that, much of that equipment has been in continuous service for Southern. I mean, for for starting in 1940, I feel because a lot of those cars were 1940s, 1950s cars that actually derailed. And when the train derailed, it like toppled cars left and right. The locomotive was fine. I don't think it actually. I don't think the actual locomotive itself derailed. I think 611 was fine. And that, that was like the second or third excursion. That was like the second major derailment she was involved in that became famous. The other one being during her service life that actually saved her from the scrapper sports actually. Uh, but I won't talk about that very often. It's probably for another video. That's actually for another video. But 611, that was one of the derailments. The next derailment that occurred was... Uh, was actually during a yard move. A couple of the cars, a couple of passenger cars that Norfolk Southern was just moving around the yard, once again, picked the switch, derailed, and were pretty damaged, pretty badly damaged during that derailment. And it was just like, and I guess that, and this was in 1994? 1990, like 1990 and 1991. So right around 1218's last couple of years. So she was operating and so was 611, 4501 was kind of winding her career down, that kind of thing. But the reason I mentioned earlier with the Great Dismal Swamp derailment that I was surprised that no one was killed is for one clip alone. The clip is from Greg Scholl's video productions of the Steam in St. Louis 1990. It was the 1990, 1990 NRHS convention in St. Louis. And there's one particular clip of 1218 as she rounds a crossing. Holy shit. The amount of people that were, like, leaning their heads out the windows. I, I, it's safe to say that the entire passenger but the everyone that was a passenger on board that train were leaning their heads out the windows and keep in mind later versions of the like, Norfolk Southern had cars that didn't have opening windows 
but almost every car in the contest did have opening windows to some extent. And there are plenty of people just sitting in the vestibules, like this view right here, just, you know, just sitting out, out on the side here, like, uh, and that's, like, it's, it's just so crazy to think that less, like, this was 20 years ago, mind you. This was now, 20 years ago, 2001, when the 1522 pulled some of her final excursions. They were still allowing people to lean their heads out the window to some extent, out of the vestibules, and grab audio and video. My dad was one of them. My dad, during his... You're, he wrote the last excursion of 1522. I have a VHS tape of him actually recording footage of 1522's final run from on board the train. And it was, and he was standing, he was leaning his head outside the window from his seat. And it's just like, that's 2002. It's now 2019 and you can't do that anymore. And granted, there should have been no reason you should have done that in the first place. I mean, granted, now granted, for Steve Oakland doing this, like, having your head out the window like this is reasonable because you can't see anything outside the freaking cab like this. You can't see the signals. You can't see what's ahead of you. The only way you'll see the signals is through, like, in-cab signaling, which the big boy actually got during her restoration. But just to think that... The way she was, like, the big boy and everything like this, it, I don't know. Ugh. doing okay now, character-wise. Now, I've gotten a few clips already lately of the 4014 as she rolled by. And I'll put those at the end of the video for those of you that want to check it out. Uh, but these are clips I took, taken during a previous recording, I just, you know, put together. They're okay, for the most part, but not too, uh, not the greatest, honestly. And this is going to be a long video, guys, so, strap yourselves in. We're probably about halfway through already, but we still got another, like, uh, 20, 30 minutes to go, because we got to go... Hair, man. It's eight, which is 20 miles from here. But, oh. I'm going to open up the throttle a bit here. There we go. Coming up to the siding here. Ah, I know. That's just, I love the chuffing sound of the big, the 844 in the back. So, oh, we got ourselves a heritage unit sitting on the side of here. He's waiting for us to clear the block. At least he's supposed to, anyway. And damn it! Fucking those! What's worse is that, uh, so I have allergies, apparently. I didn't know this for about a good... Well, 90% of my life, I didn't realize I had allergies. But now that I know that I have allergies, it's becoming a very big annoyance to me. Oops. God damn it, that view. I hate it. I hate that view. I'll just pop this down here. A couple of just an image there of us rolling by. It's a manifest. I feel like I should have added a driver to this train. That way, once we passed it and started moving on its own and through a portal further down the line, kind of clearing up some memory. But then again, I don't really, that's not really necessary too much. That is unless there is a portal not far from us. I feel like there is a portal I'm missing. No, it doesn't look like it. I think the nearest portal, like one of them, that very portal at Spear. Yeah. Which, by the way, he's actually a new signing now. So, the departure time for him would have probably been like 
10 30 or so just waiting for us to clear that's not too bad you know what I'll do that I'll make this conscious move once we get clear of the block because we're not like too far like we wouldn't take too long to get through Well, why I have the strange fascination with the fact that the the bulk of each contest is pretty much just three locomotives at the front end and two locomotives at the rear. Okay, there we go. What the fuck? Oh, there we go. Okay, we're at 35 miles an hour. That's good. Whew. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yep. They're going by. There we go. Yeah, we should be pretty much within that block, so be fine. There we go. Now, next station. Harriman, but we got to go through Lynch first. So, we can do that. That shit. Ow. Oh, sorry if I'm hitting the mic here. Well, guys, well here a little bit. Uh, maybe we don't kind of overspeed here. We want to keep our speed, uh, uh, you know, slightly low. We're at 61% water in the boiler. We're gonna go ahead and put some water in there. It looks like we will only need to really water ourselves twice during this run, two or three times. One to spear, one to MK. running smoothly here. So, I, I got a lot of screenshots for this run and um, the only really things that will need to be finished up for this run probably adding a few consists running here and there. Um, I have two si there's two si consists in the sidings one of which I'll probably get moving the other one I'm not exactly sure if I'll you know have it operating or not. But out of the, the entirety, out of everything, I know that I want to get that manifest moving again. And that... And the only other thing I would feel that, you know, it's sort of... The only other thing I feel like I should do, per se, is just to add more people. That's about it. But yeah, that's not too hard to do when you're dealing with this kind of run. You kind of have a general idea of where everybody was during the operation. So. Let's see here. We got six miles. We're not doing too bad. We can actually get this done pretty quickly if we're good with it. Uh, getting tired here. Yeah. 
Yeah, this operation has been very interesting to say the least. Okay, am I, okay here we are. I should keep an eye on the water level or more. Okay, we're good. There we are. Yeah, six miles. So about five miles now. Or so, I don't know. One hell of a show. Not very many crossings for me to deal with out here, really. That's sort of good. Back, what am I doing? What is that view? Is that seven? Yeah. I need to remove, I, you know what, I want to remove the 7 key off the top of, the top of my keyboard, just so I don't press that view again, that's just stupid. Who uses that view? Seriously, who does? Who is you? Alright. So, okay. What was it expecting us at? 11.02? That's about right. That's what I found. What I was about to do. Now, unless we stop at another siding and wait for who knows how long for another train to pass, I don't think we'll be, you know, arriving at 11.10, which is what we're supposed to. Keep in mind that the scenario timetables are very much based on the actual timetable that 4014 was operating under. So she is actually the so the timing of each stop, which whether it be Harriman or Cheyenne, is the exact same as she would be, you know, if she were to depart the two in real life. So technically she is well operating kind of in the same schedule. Five miles now. I can't see. Probably gonna pause very shortly to kind of walk around and get up and try and wake up because I am not being able to keep my eyes open here. Yeah, I need to do that now. All right, be a bit. Is that time of the week again? It's time for the screenshot of the week, and once again, we have three screenshots to show off. Also, from this point on, the screenshot of the week will be released as a separate video with an insert in the Trackside video series later on. Now, on to the screenshots. The first of which is from Grinza. His screenshot shows a BNSF mast vest freight as it travels over the famous Marias Pass. Marias Pass has been featured on quite a few rail sims since its introduction in Microsoft Train Simulator in 2001, with its latest appearance in 2013 with Railworks. Unfortunately, due to a licensing dispute between the BNSF Railway and Dovetail Games, the route is no longer available outside the United States of America. Next, we have another screenshot from yours truly. This time, we see Union Pacific 4014 as she pulls a fully loaded stack train, otherwise known as an intermodal train, through Dale Junction. This contest is a recreation of a similar contest that 4014 sister, Union Pacific Challenger number 3985, pulled on August 1st, 1990. On that day, 3985 pulled a 143 car stack train unassisted from Cheyenne to North Platte when it took three massive GE locomotives to even get the train to Cheyenne. Lastly, we have a screenshot from the Southern Crescent. His screenshot from Trains New Era shows a Canadian Pacific passenger train traveling through a foggy winter scene. Much like Orange BNSF screenshot from last week, it just goes to show just how far the little sim from Down Under has come since it was first released back in 2001. If you want to be featured on the screenshot of the week, then head over to the North American Railways Discord page. From there, you can enter your screenshots in the Contest Entries tab. And while you're at at it, make sure to check out my Facebook page, where I post channel news and updates every so often. Also, if you want a sneak peek into my day-to-day -day life, then check out my Twitter, at underscore ShadowSteel18 underscore. Okay. Okay, after that, I'm just keep an eye on everything. How far are we? Four miles. 
0.5 really. We got quite a bit of go. So not only is this a big year for us on the tra for Railwork Sunday, uh, well, not Railwork Sunday, track side. Kind of get right in the meat, meat and bones of this. What's going on here? So, yeah, this is gonna this is gonna be a big year for this for my channel. So I have so for those of you that don't know, I have two different channels. I have this one, Virtual Real Fan Productions, and then I have a second one uh, called The Otaku Gamer. Now, I tend to play, you know, general games like Fallout 76 is one of the big ones I've been playing lately. A few anime games, JRPGs and whatnot. And I've been, you know, branching out to some other games, but I've been sort of kind of toying with the idea of doing, like, you know, a lot of other things, things that I have yet to really cover. Whoops. Ah, shit. This is why you don't talk and drive. Ah. But, um, yeah, this is one of those things, this is one of those years, at least for me, where I am going to be doing a lot of stuff throughout the year. Now, granted, there is no set schedule for any release ever. The only reason I'm saying that this is going to be released on May 10th of 2019 is because this is kind of what I want this to be. This is what the May 10th, 2019 anniversary, 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad completion. I mean, there's going to be ha a hashtag in the title for the first time, or hashtag really in the description for the first time. It's, it's going to be a big deal for me. It is a big deal. Because I rarely, and I mean rarely, get, like, really into this kind of stuff and this is a big deal the 150th anniversary of the transcontinental railroad's completion was no, the, the the transcontinental railroad was no small feat even back then or even today really because very few railroads today take on that kind of scale of construction so what we saw with the completion of the transcontinental railroad was the birth of a nation and it, I mean, the fact that the Union Pacific had gone out of their way to do the impossible a second time around, and what I mean by that is that nobody thought the big boy would ever return to service. Nobody did. I remember when I was back in high, in middle school, I would have been 12, 13 years old by this time, I saw stories like, uh, Union Pacific, like, what would you want to see back, return to the rails if they had a chance to build one from the ground up, or a chance to restore one? And everybody would usually pick the big boy. The, the big boy was always the top one. Like, everybody wanted to see it. But I don't think anybody in their right minds would have thought that the Union Pacific would go out of their way in 2014 to announce, oh, we're going to restore a big boy. We're going to restore 4014. And then... Five years later, in 2019, start operating her under her own steam. It's just insane. Sorry, I got a bad note. I got a clogged, uh, stuffed up nose, so that's why it sounds different. Ah. But, yeah, this is one of those things that, this has been a big year, not just for the Union Pacific, not just for this channel, but... For the end of the Sherman Hill saga, I really wanted to do something big. I really wanted to kind of show off like uh, one of my first major scenarios that I've released in a long time. I still have plans to finish up a lot of other scenarios and a lot of other projects. But yeah, we got a lot going on right now. And it's just now it's just we're just getting started with this channel. Next year, 2020, will be the fifth anniversary of Virtual Rail Fan Productions, it, you know, appearance on YouTube. And um, I want to do something special for that. And I have plans for that, guys. So, I mean, this is this is actually one of those like. Particular op the, like particular things that you slowly realize just how big of a deal like small small milestones. So 
last year in 2018, I reached 100 subs, 100 subscribers on this channel. I've now reached 130 subscribers, so a little bit higher than it was back in July of 2018. But even so, this was the first time I've really gotten such a huge amount of subscribers. I never really thought I would reach 100 subscribers because I played such a niche set of games. I played such a small amount a game that nobody should really care about. But apparently there's such an audience out there that are somewhat curious about what I play that they will often go and see my videos. Now granted, the views are not the best. I mean, some of my videos are pretty lackluster. But it kind of inspired me to improve, kind of do this for fun at the same time. And it's kind of a, ch it is a challenge. It is a challenge to get a video like this up and running on a set schedule. Especially when you have so many things working against you. And that's kind of why I feel like when I meet people like my buddy Arjun, he's, he's got his own channel. He's also the admin of the Gamers Point group, uh, and his internet and stuff, it's really, it's, it's hard for him, too, and he and I, like, kind of to talk every so often, and I would, I would suggest going, checking out his channel. He's mainly, do he mainly does trucking videos and whatnot. But he'll occasionally play the a few other videos here and there, like you know, a few other games here and there. But like as a whole, this is one of those like like when you find a small channel, give them a bit of love. Tell that like show them like, hey, you did a decent job, or give them some constructive criticism. Now, if they're a trolling video, then yeah, don't bother with that. But if it's like a small channel that's doing some decent work then go ahead and by all means just tell them thank you for working as hard as you've done and you know just you know, that kind of stuff it's uh, just a simple thing it's one of the reasons why i say like and comment down below and i mean it's i just want that i want to, to hear your guys' feedback i want to know how you view these videos like i mean like i said Arjun, he often comments on my videos like, hey, great job, man. You did a great job. And Smokebox. During my Sherman, during the whole over the hill scenarios, he would always comment saying, giving me constructive criticism. One of the things about the, um, the whole missing the point segment from uh, the Sherman Hill saga that talked about Prometary Point, or Prometary Summit, rather. That was because somebody left a comment on my, one of my videos saying that it was not promontory, that I was wrong, and I admitted that. That it was, that I said in the video that it was Promontory Point where they met up, but in fact it was Promontory Summit. So, and I love that. I love getting feedback from you guys uh, when it comes to that kind of stuff. I'm sorry, I'm just rambling on now. We'll be making a surfacing stop just. We'll be making a surfacing stop over at Harriman. Be ready to slow down. But yeah, it's like... But yeah, it's honestly one of those things like... Once I start seeing... Like, I see... I'm always open to constructive criticism. Now, if you're a troll, then... I'm not really going to pay attention to you. I'm not going to be that... I'm not going to be that guy. I'm not going to feed the troll. But, even if you are a troll, I will at least try and constructively put together what you're trying to say. And try constructively. Like, that's the key word here, is constructive. It's always imperative to always give out, like, a constructive criticism is a great thing. And I feel like that's being lost with this generation. Look at me, I'm sounding like I'm at a million years old now. But, if you, like, the, the whole thing between Epic Games, and this is a whole other video on it of itself, the Epic Games Steam debacle, the war between Epic Games and Steam, I felt like, 
I feel like the odd man out because I don't look at this as a, I don't really care either way what system, like what launcher I use, whether I use the Epic Games Store or if I use Steam. If it has a game I want to play on it, I will play it on that storefront. If it's cheaper on that storefront, then I'll get it on that storefront. There's a whole list of reasons that I can give less of a fuck. Like, I cannot really care about the whole... And a lot of these things, like the whole Chinese spying thing, like that, that's all fault. That's not... It's, sure, Epic is owned by Tencent, by 40%. But keep in mind, they also own PUBG, they own League of Legends, they own, uh, which by the way, Riot Games is a whole lot of shit too. They own Blizzard Activision, who owns Overwatch. And like that whole, that Tencent is a big company and they own almost a bunch, probably a good chunk of American gaming developers. Now, granted, Cy the acquisition of Psyonix was a little underhanded, but then again, Microsoft is doing the same thing, if you think about it. And I feel like, but the whole, the reason I say this is that, that there's no constructive criticism, there's no, like, looking beyond, like, actually having the discussion. It's either I'm right, you're wrong, or we're done. It's, that's the whole thing. People don't have discussions. They don't have constructive discussions. They whine, bitch, and moan, basically saying, um, I am right, you are wrong, you just don't talk to me unless you agree with me. It's stupid. And to me, for me, I personally will have constructive criticism. I will have a discussion if something comes up that I look at and I'm like, that doesn't seem right, but okay, I'll try to look into it. Uh, it's just, I that's not the way my mind works. I mentioned before in another video, I have autism and that I'm on the higher end of the spectrum. I was talking with somebody recently that he didn't know I was autistic and he thought that autistic people this get the, were the, like pretty much like the drooling in the cup kind of people. Basically, the, those that couldn't talk, basically threw temper tantrums all the time. He was thinking of the lower end of the spectrum. He didn't real. I don't think he realized that there's a spectrum for the autism scale. So. I have a higher functioning form of autism, basically, or I can form coherent sentences or whatnot. But for him, it was, for him, he always thought about the lower end. And that's due to pop, pop culture. Nobody really discusses in full detail, really, like, and to put this kind of together, I guess you could say, I'm rambling on here at this point. To put this kind of together, I feel like people nowadays are acting like the lower end of the autism scale. They're whining, bitching, moaning, throwing temper tantrums over, this is what I deserve, this is what I want. You don't deserve shit. You need, people need to learn that you have to earn the, what you want. That's what I, that's, and I, I feel like I did, even though I feel, the, even though I do have 100 subscribers now, I don't feel like I've earned them, really. I didn't do much to push for 100 subs. I, in fact, I didn't do anything until, like, I saw that I was at 95 subs. I'm like, oh, I'm at 95 subs? Well, I just get five more. But that was the thing. Once I realized what was going on, what I was doing, I felt like I had to keep pushing myself. I had to keep going. I had to keep... I have a part-time job over at Michael's Craft Store. At a Michael's Craft Store. And more often than not, I, if there's an evaluation going on, 
like an employee evaluation, I will rank myself much lower than what the employees say. And in fact, it got to the, at one point in high school when I was at when I was in high school, I was doing a little program called work study, it was an IEP program, a special school district program, and I rated myself very lowly. I was like. I don't think I did very well here. I didn't do well here. I think I did okay here, but not great. I think I could do better here. And the teacher came up to me eventually and looked at me like, and he said, you, you're you rating yourself much lower than you realize. You're, you, you, and that's what I feel like. I feel like I look down on myself and I feel that, but I feel that I'm the only one that does that. I feel that, Everyone else looks at themselves highly, like, like, not to bring politics into this, but if you think about it, it's the whole, like, uh, I, 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 describe that. Uh, it's, so it's, people just think, it's just, I'm at a loss for words at this point. Because when you, like, when people just go off and try and do their own thing, they want to, they think they deserve a world and a half, uh, and that kind of thing, it's just, you don't deserve anything. People have to earn their living. People have to earn their keep. And to say, oh, I deserve this. I deserve that. No, you have to work for it. And, and if there's like charities, like if you need help, go look for it. Like that's the whole thing about this. This is, um, I mean, for me, I have always seen myself more or less being kind of, what the hell? I was like, oh, it's too there. Oh, okay. So, I mean, that, I mean, I don't know. It really does seem like they're kind of dropping pretty heavy down here towards the end of this scenario. Because we're finally approaching Harriman here. But, to kind of, like, tie everything up, we built a nation off the idea that you need to earn your living. You need to earn you need to earn what you you know it's that kind of thing. It's very complicated I feel. But we didn't start this country on the idea that we are we are the king of the world. We deserve everything. It just I don't know. It really does feel like we have forgotten what made us great, what made us America. And I just I don't know. It feels like for the most part, we're in this part of our lives where there is going to be, I don't know, it feels like over time we're going to end up in a situation where we are not America. We are not what we came to be. We are not what we were supposed to be yet. Like, if the Founding Fathers found us today, like, saw what we became, they would shit their pants. They would be so pissed that a bunch of whiny babies and children and whatnot have taken over the country. I guess I did go to politics eventually. And, just, I don't know. It feels stupid. I mean... World War Two. This is how far we've come. So World War Two was like 1945. World War Two. 
the men, the men and where the men, the soldiers came home. They basically won the war, tooth, fought tooth and nail. Then, about two decades later, in 1960, we went to Vietnam, and we fought a completely different war. In World War II, we fought and claimed territory. In Vietnam, we fought a body count war. Remind me when a war, remind me when it became commonplace. So this is when, this is kind of where things went downhill for us, I feel. Like, this was the beginning of the downfall of the United States, I feel, was Vietnam. And I want to talk about this more in a lo longer form video, kind of giving us, and I kind of have an idea of what I can do with it, actually, considering what co is coming up this June. But, um, yeah. Uh, just the amount of things that have happened over the years, like, in the past 60 years, 60 years, mind you, we've changed a ton, and I feel that some things we've changed for the better, while others, we've changed for the worse, but that is my personal opinion. You guys might see it differently. And that's fine. It's all a matter of opinion. There's no right or wrong answer. And as we approach here, as we stop here, passing a one unit wonder, by the way. Uh, I, it just, I feel like you guys have really help this channel grow a great deal. This is how we ended up becoming our channel as we know it today. This is how things ended up becoming, you know, the way it is. So, as we approach our final stop, I'm going to actually shut down the throttle and sound the bell. Uh, notice we have a 50 mile an hour limit, but that's going to be changed during the final version of the scenario. Uh, but, just think about the idea of, again, leaving a comment down below, subscri uh, subscribing if you like this video, uh, leave a like, uh, talk, just give me your feedback. I mean, you would think that, to some extent, you would, you know, realize that, there's a lot more to this world that people, like, as my dad would say, worry about yourself before you worry about others. And even though I have pretty much done just the opposite of that, I feel that the world is doing that too. The world essentially has started worrying about others rather than themselves. If something were, I, it's just, I don't know, leave your thoughts down below. It's just, I honestly feel like the world has changed a great deal, especially within my lifetime. I mean, the past 15 years have been so different from one another. And... I feel like you guys, especially those of you that are my age, probably either don't realize how much of the world has changed or don't really care for it too much. But it's one of those things that I, you know, come across and, um... I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to pause it here. I want to get one shot left. There's one particular screenshot I need to... I don't know, I took that screenshot already. Never mind. Alrighty. Come to a stop here at Harriman. You see, we got a crowd here. 
No worry, this crowd's gonna get bigger. Nice work so far. We still have a long way to go before we reach Laramie. Alright. So like I said before, guys, this scenario is about 75 minutes long. 70, 70 to 75 minutes long. It took us about 70 minutes, about, to get this done. So, again, like and comment down below. Subscribe if you guys want more. And I will see you guys in the very next video. Take care.